But that being said, if you take the rookie, all right, fine, scratch that. I like no, no, that no. idea, but scratch. No, I like the idea. I like I like what I came up with after that is the well, fact that if you take the rookie wage scale off of the salary cap, yeah, just remove it. Just remove it. Don't count it doesn't count. Salary cap, and no. you have a salary cap minimum that you have to make, and you, you, have to you have raise it to ninety five percent, right? Not eighty nine. Yep. Yeah, I'm definitely down with that. That makes a ton of sense. Oh God, it's so. You know, here's what I don't understand. Talk we got to me. two. Freaking morons driving around in a Murano in Lockport and Niagara Falls and Tonawanda and North Tonawanda, and we're coming up with all, we're having a great football conversation. And then the NFL owners go, "Oh, let's play 18 games where old, where players only have to play 16 games, 16 game cap, 18 game schedule." Get the f- out of here with that nonsense. You're come on. I echo your sentiment, Paul. and ride with us on YouTube and don't forget to check out live play-by-play of the Bills season coming up on Sportscaster. Let's talk Bills free agency. Not 2019, like who's going to be a free agent in 2020. 2020 Let's talk 2021 because here's a major problem in the Why is that relevant, Paul? Oh, allow me to tell you, Mario. There's a major problem in the NFL right now with players trying to get out of deals or trying to secure deals while they're still under contract. It's a major rash because there's a possible work stoppage coming in 2021 with a new collective bargaining agreement. So just to give you guys a heads up, how does this impact the Bills? Well, in 2019, they have 92 guys currently under roster. That includes guys on injured reserve. True. Um, In 2020, they have 56 guys on the roster, right? Not hateful. 2021, they go to 36. That's not good. That's not good, right? So if there's a possible... It's like the Rams this offseason. Right, exactly. Everybody's going to be gone. Um, so there's a major problem with um, uh, players wanting to make sure that they're going to have contracts already secured before the 2021 season. They're going to take them through 2021 in case there's a work stoppage. And here's why. The last thing you want to do is have a possible lockout happen, right? Start, and then let's say the Players Association of the NFL make an agreement and the season's going to start in 12 weeks. You don't want to be that free agent. Because no. you're just going to be, you're going to be, whoever calls first is where I'm going, I guess. Yeah. And then you're going to sign a one year deal and you're going to be a free agent again. You don't want that. Is there a flip side of it where the guys that are signing contracts want them to end prior to the new CBA renegotiation because they want to see what the new CBA will bring? Or do they want to take contract past it like three or four years? There's so many guys holding out for new deals. It makes me think like their agents are telling them, listen, you don't want to be on the other side of the CBA because you don't know what's there. True. You take what you can get right now. So you have Zeke Elliott holding out, Melvin Gordon holding out, Michael Thomas holding out. So they all want to sign their contracts in 2020 before the new CBA gets renegotiated because they have no idea if it might hinder rookie deals, veteran Mm -hmm. deals, stuff like that. I agree and disagree both with your point. Okay. Because I think, true, it could be a financial uh, reason why this is all going on with the mm-hmm. with Melvin Gordon, Michael Thomas, and all that stuff, and all these guys are starting to follow suit. Le'Veon Bell was the first guy to try to get it done. Right. Uh, and I understand that. However, if you take a look at it, I think this is more the DeMarco Murray effect than it is the new CBA coming on. Okay. So and you- let me explain why. Okay. Okay, because we talked about this briefly in an episode, I think, two weeks ago. DeMarco Murray, if if my number is correct, uh, he played for Dallas for four years. In his second year, four. Yep, because he he wasn't a first-rounder. Okay, so he he had a four-year deal for the Cowboys. His second year and his third year combined, he had like 370 carries or something like that. Right. Uh, I'll flash the graphic. I can't remember the numbers. In his final year with the Cowboys, because they were having trouble renegotiating a deal, because at the end of his third year, he can start to renegotiate. Right. You know, everyone knows that. Um, he had 392 carries in his fourth year. Yeah. So the, the thought process, at least it seemed from Dallas at the time, was, listen, we're going to run you because we're not going to have you next year. Right. And every other team, all the 31 other teams, are going to see how much we've beat you up this year. And they're going to avoid you. And they're going to avoid you. So you're, we're going to sign you for cheap anyway. Right. That being said, he only played three more years after that. He played two years with the Eagles, and he played one year with Tennessee, and then he was done. Yep. 
that being what has happened, what has transpired with running backs in a passing league in the NFL, right. their value has been diminished. A lot of these running backs see that. So, listen, I need to get paid now before you beat me up. Uh, Le'Veon Bell was the first guy to see that. Melvin Gordon was, was another guy to see that. Ezekiel Elliott's another guy to see that. We don't know how many other holdouts are going to be. I think with my tin hat, that plays a factor here. Okay. Because he was the okay, top running back in the NFL, 1,800 yards rushing. He caught like another 50 passes that year. Mm-hmm. He's like, listen, I don't want to be some, like gear that gets used up in four years and I'm retired at 28. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do that. I don't want to play. Right. Yeah, that's a great point because two of two of the guys holding out right now are running backs. Yeah, so it's, that's a great point to be made. I have a feeling like a lot of it is these guys, one, want to avoid free agency in 2021. Yes. But two, they want two years of solid pay leading into 2021, right? They want a solid paycheck in 2019, a solid paycheck in 2020, and then whatever 2021 brings, they're already prepared for it. They, they don't have to live in a, you know, they don't have to live in a, a fallout shelter. You know, they're going to be fine, <laughs> right? But I think there's also a bargaining chip that plays to the Bills' advantage here. I'm listening. Okay. So you have a lot of players that are coming up for free agency in 2021. You name three big ones. Poyer, Milano, Dawkins. Okay. Those are three big ones, right? Yeah. Okay. Don't you think it would be easier to go to the table and say, listen, guys, hate to break it to you, but, you know, we're talking with the Players Association right now. I don't know what's going to happen. And you might be a free agent come 2021. So why don't we lock this deal down now, and then you won't have to worry about it, right? Do you think that will encourage players to sign extensions that might be free agents in 2021? It could be. Because, don't get me wrong, I'm not a big fan of extending Dawkins. Not exactly my priority. But I do not want to let Poirier walk. I do not want to let Milano walk. And Trey if, White's another one. Oh, jeez. Yeah, okay, Trey White. But you have a fifth-year option on You do have the fifth-year option He's protected. On him. Right, but for again, that year at least. But it's that's an even bigger chip to go to Trey and say, "Listen, dude, you're gonna get to 2021. That's fine. I don't know what's gonna be on the other side of 2021 they for may, you." They may max out the salary cap, the fifth year options. Right, so exactly. You don't, you don't, you don't know. So that's uh, what I'm saying. If they bring in something like max contracts, this might be a bad thing for you. I so, think. Yeah, I think everything considered, what you're talking about plays out well, mm-hmm. except for Poyer and White. I think they're going to stay the course with White with the fifth-year option, try to negotiate something before he has to you know, do the fifth-year option, because that makes sense. As far as Poyer goes, you know you're going to be sending a message to the rest of the team for how much this guy has sacrificed himself for the team. The flip side of that is you're only going to pay the guy for what he's going to produce. You're not paying him for what he did. I well, understand that's, that. But that's a big – you're bringing up a great point, and it's, a, it's not a counter to you, but it, it's a highlight of what you're trying to say here, and that is that the Bills have only paid guys who have turned around and produced for them. Mm-hmm. How many guys have they paid who have been on the downslope? None. None. No. They haven't brought any in. And now once you start re-signing guys, that's when you start treading water to the, okay, we might be paying guys for past performance here. right? Like Hughes. Hughes is right. a great great example. You extend him well, he, for the production you think it. he's going to give you. Yeah, well, he earned it. But he did. He did. Season. I think you pay Poyer it, personally. I think you pay Poyer because I think he's still got a lot of football left in him, not knowing what's going to happen over the next couple of years. But I think they are going to stay the course with like a guy like Milano, a guy like Dawkins. They're going to say, listen. But you know, the CBA could be whispering in these players' ears, be like, listen, if you sign this, you could sign it. But we're projected to give you at least four or five mil- more million dollars to your contract with the negotiations that we're going through because of the revenue that the NFL has been able to generate and all these teams, all the money these teams are making, all right? We, we messed up the last CBA. We messed it up. Ah, they did. Okay, we messed it up. So we're going to try to rectify that and fix it this this time around, and you're going to get more money. So that that could be going in the ears of these players that may be free agents in 2021 I would, and say, listen, I want more money. This is what I'm projected to get. If you can't reach this number, I'm not going to play. If I'm a player, I just don't have faith that the Players Association is going to be able to outwit the NFL owners because because they I, struck out before. Right, they're over. They're over two. Yeah, like I wouldn't trust that they're going to figure it out this time. Yeah. Right, the, the owners seem to always be ahead of the rules. Right, they always seem to understand what happens because the last CBA, the NFL players were like, listen, we have to get more long term uh, employment. Let's get. If you're a veteran player and you sign for under a million dollars, let's count your salary cap to uh, only a third-year player. 
And for those guys that aren't aware of that, that's it in the collective bargaining agreement. If you sign a veteran player to under one to under a one million dollar deal, they count league minimum as a third year player, not to whatever it is. So I'll give you an example. Let's say Lee Adrian Waddle um, signed a deal for nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. okay? He's only going to count $750,000 against your cap. Why? Because he's a vested veteran. He's got more than four years in the league, right? Yep. And in order to encourage teams to sign veteran players, the NFL and the Players Association agree, like, listen, you'll pay him $900,000, but from a salary cap perspective, you only have to count seven hundred and fifty. dollars I, I see it. I see. Right? So there's yep. credits that are built in there. The NFL Players Association was convinced that was going to give veteran players the opportunity to continue their careers didn't have any impact at all. What they didn't realize is that by having instituting a rookie wage scale where a third round pick who is going to be a quality player for you on a controllable deal for four years, the most you're ever going to have to pay him is $600,000. You're not going to pay a veteran that. Exactly. It doesn't matter. Exactly. Uh, my question to you is this. If in the new CBA they negotiate because they do have a rookie wage scale. Yep. So what's going on is a lot of these players are coming in, they're getting paid minimal amount of money in their eyes for their right. production, and then they're trying to get a, a big contract for the second contract, and then they get into the 30s, they ride off into the sunset. Um, if you think to avoid these guys holding out to try to get a big contract for their second deal, if they rescinded the rookie wage scale... Do you think that would have an impact on veterans? Or do you think that would, they would sign more veterans because they don't want to draft a guy that's going to cost them $40 million out of the gate? I mean, that's that's what the rookie wage scale was there to do, right? And the rookie wage scale was there. Because let's, let's also not forget that since the last CBA was signed, it's a totally different group of players. Absolutely. So yes. the, the, those players... Eight have, years ago, right? Right, exactly. Those players, the only thing they know is the rookie wage scale, right? Do you think they have a problem with it? I'm sure they'd like it to be more. Well, I think if there's going to be anything, the wage scale is going to be there, but it's going to it's going to exponentially increase. Well, because what you said, they they unless they increase. Okay, all right, I can see them if they increase the rookie wage scale. That'd be one thing, but you're seeing that's the reason they're seeing all these veterans get left out in the cold because their teams are, are clamoring for draft picks. They can get younger, they can get their own guys, they can mold them who they want to do. Uh, they can do all that. So you're seeing all these veterans get left out in the cold. So these guys are like, listen, I, I, at the end of your first deal, you're between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. So, what do you do for that? Do you have rookie deals be only three years and the fifth and the fifth year option because of fourth fourth year option mm -hmm. to try to avoid this? So guys are still young and they're still affordable. Uh, do you have does that increase the, the the guys playing through injury because they're only they're on a three year deal? The the, the, uh, the what the happens? salary cap credit is a great concept. It was just instituted in a poor manner. So the salary cap credit system is really good. Because nobody knows about it. That's well, exactly nobody talks about it anymore because barely any teams use it. Yeah, they'd um, rather use a draft pick. Right. So you're right. What you have to do is you have to take those rookie deals and you have to chop a year off them. Right. You make them shorter. Right. Okay. And then what you do is you take that salary cap credit system that they have and say, okay, listen, once you enter your fourth season, you could start getting counted as a veteran credit. And what you do is you count it against and you make the minimum like what their salary cap cost is. Um, you make it, you make it worth the first year of a rookie player, right? So, because those minimum rookie wage scales, the contract goes up every year. Right now, mm -hmm. it's based off of what a player costs in his third year. Mm -hmm. What you should do is you should make it what the cost is of a rookie draft pick, like a, a third round rookie draft pick. So they'd be more willing to sign a veteran versus trading for a draft pick. Right, exactly. That's why draft picks are so coveted because that's how teams are building their rosters because it's cheap and it's they're very cheap. you can turn and burn, right? Yeah. So instead what they should do is they should chop off a year of the rookie wage scale deal, make every draft pick a three year deal, first round picks a fourth year deal. Your veteran rookie credit system that you have right now, um, you base that off of a rookie's salary not off a third-year player salary because if I have an opportunity to uh, 
bring in a rookie who I'm going to control for four years or bring in a vet. I'm going to bring in the rookie who I can control for four years. And they have to get rid of this exclusive rights nonsense and restricted free agent nonsense because you have players like Robert Foster who will never make over a million dollars for the first four years of his career. It will not happen. He oh. will not make over a million dollars. It's written in stone, 100% he can't will not hold make a million dollars. And he can't do anything about it because he's an exclusive rights free agent, which means he's going to get signed to league minimum, and then he'll be uh, a restricted, free, a restricted free agent, which means another team's going to offer him big money or he's going to end up signing for league minimum at again. His, at, again, right? It just sucks. So the Players Association really dropped the ball, and if I were a player, I'd be trying to do exactly what these players are doing and getting paid right now. Give me money right now because I don't trust your <laughs> to go in and negotiate anything that's going to work out for me in three years. No way. What if? Because, I mean, this is all hypotheticals that we're talking about, the majority of them. What if they limited... Would this work? What if they limited the amount of draft picks a team could have? See, I think they should expand. What if they only had nine... They were only allowed nine picks? I would go back to ten rounds. Really? Go back to ten rounds. You, you think it would make the problem worse? Because teams are clamoring for draft picks. You don't, you don't think those eighth, ninth, and tenth round picks would be You're more coveted? them anyway. You're through undrafted free agency. You're signing them So anyway. you're keeping those guys for four years at least instead of just... You keep them for four years regardless if you sign them as an undrafted free agent. Right, because you're... Yeah, because they're in the exclusive rights free agent. So you're agent not really changing anything cycle. if you expanded the draft is what you're saying. What I'm saying is if you if you go ahead and chop off a year, right, you expand the draft to 10 rounds, okay? Now there's less rookie free agents available, Okay. And you have more tradable assets. And those tradable assets often are tradable assets for veteran players, right? So you're going to keep the cycle of a veteran player's life around a little bit more. If you expand the draft, you eliminate um, you eliminate that whole process of the uh, exclusive rights free agents. Uh, teams are going to start devaluing draft picks um, if the players after year one can go wherever they want. If you get rid of exclusive rights free agents and restricted free agents and make Everybody a free agent, period, the end at all times, every game changes. Because if I'm if I'm a GM, I'm gonna bring in a player with four years experience versus the kid that's got, you know, a year down in Tampa. I'm not I'll bring in a player with four years experience. That's what I'm doing. I would expand the draft, get rid of the ex- exclusive rights free agent nonsense that keeps players in team control for years and um, it, but again, I'm taking this at the angle of the players as you know is that what's going to happen? I really seriously doubt it. I got the fix for you. Okay. I, I got it. it. All right. It's simple. It's to the point. Give it to me. You got it. Same amount of rounds. Okay. Same amount of players. Mm-hmm. Here's the rookie weight scale. Okay. If you're a first round pick, mm-hmm. for the first four years of your contract, you make four, three, two, one. That's your rookie weight scale. What do you mean you make four? You make $10 two, million dollars if you get drafted in the first round. Okay. Okay. You decrease that five hundred thousand per round. Okay. So if you're a second round pick, you make three three point five, two point five. These are over the course of the season. Over the se- course oh, of the, the your, your the seasons. Life of so, the contract. So you got okay. the four year deal, mm-hmm. four, three, two, one. By the time you hit that one, then you can renegotiate for a new contract. But you're getting ten million dollars out of the gate. Mm-hmm. As a twenty one year old kid, you're getting ten million. Four three two one. You treat it as a signing bonus. So then the teams only need to account for that cap that first year. Mm-hmm. Okay? So what you're doing is you're accounting. It's like a cash spend right. for the first year. So if you make your draft, that cash spend is already at the top. Mm-hmm. Or you could say it doesn't count against your salary cap. Your rookie your rookie deals do not count against the salary cap. Oh, that's fascinating. So if the rookie if deals don't count. The rookie, if you exclude, exclude the draft the picks deals, from your salary cap. And then they're able to sign whoever they want. But well, they have it, to sign veteran players. They would. Then because you, there'd be a salary floor minimum. Exactly. So that, that's that being, fascinating. That being said, you just keep it consistent throughout. Okay, you're a first round pick. This is what you make. You're a second round pick. This oh. is what you make. All right. So you're, you're talking about balancing out the, the amount of player that you're going to have because if you have a 4-3-2-1 system I know it was very basic and Neanderthal yeah, yeah. but I'm just trying to say here well, I mean, hey look we can get this guy in the second round he only costs us $500,000 less I heard you you <laughs> jerk <laughs> uh-